pattern formation here. So, <laughs> so um, before we actually, very early on in development, due to these cytoplasmic determinants, certain genes are turned on and off. Um, and this helps to eventually uh, give the organism its ultimate 3D arrangement and also segmentation. The axis is, um, when we say that the major axes are determined, that's the head, tail, front, back, left, right, um, and so on. And so this uh, has been studied in a lot of different organisms. The fruit fly is uh, what we're going to talk about. And there's been a lot of study with the fruit fly. Uh, and so what do we, we mean by pattern formation? So for the fruit fly, there are certain areas of the body, like the head, the thorax, the abdomen. So this is a pattern. And this is a pattern that's in all insects, OK? And so and there are genes that control the development of this pattern. And so in studying um, fruit flies, the developmental mutants, um, they studied mutants that developed uh, wrong. And studying these developmental mutants laid the groundwork for understanding the mechanism for development. So mutations that affect segmentation are likely to be embryonic lethal, so usually they die um, if they have uh, a mutation involving segmentation um, leading to death. And, but these mutations were really, really important to determine um, what genes did and what genes controlled uh, your segments of the body. So this picture here shows you this. This is the head of a fruit fly. And so the big red things are their eyes. So remember, red is the wild type. On the left-hand side is the wild type uh, fruit fly head in the regular development. And on the right is a mutant. The mutant has legs growing out from where the antenna should be. All right, so this is a mutant phenotype. So what they've done. <laughs> So this, this fly died, <laughs> but this is what we're talking about when they, when they they when studying segmentation and how different body parts become where they are at and what controls them is that oftentimes that they look at organisms where things have gone awry, so there's mutations, looked at where the mutations are, and that gives you a clue as to what genes are controlling that to looking for the mutations. All right, so studying mutant organisms is helpful uh, in figuring out what controls the normal wild type organism. So what they found, and we're going to talk about head and tail, these axis uh, establishment that there are these things called maternal effect genes that code for these cytoplasmic determinants. And these cytoplasmic determinants are the first thing that initially established the axis of the body of Drosophila. These genes also are called egg polarity genes because they control the orientation of the egg and consequently the fly. And I'll give you an example here. Yes. What a real uh, example of like early Yes, yes. And we're going to talk, okay. we're going to talk, I have a little video that shows up here. Okay, so we're going to look at one maternal effect gene called the bicoid gene. It affects the front half of the body. Um, really, when it says front half, um, you might want to put in parentheses the head and tail region. Um, That's what it affects. An embryo whose mother has a mutant bicoid gene lacks the front half of its body and has duplicate posterior structures at both ends. Posterior structures are the tail region. This phenotype suggests that the product of the mother's bicoid gene is concentrated at the future anterior end or head end. This hypothesis is an example of what we call the gradient hypothesis, in which gradients of substances called morphogens establish an embryo's axis and other features. So the gradient hypothesis, um, we used the word gradient when we talked about diffusion and osmosis. I used the word concentration gradient. What did that mean? Concentration gradient. They would establish like a level of, they use that for sodium and potassium in um, cell membranes and neuron cells where there would be a kind of
concentration gradient where um, it would cause a, a, a want to like diffuse inward, but it's something that's preventing it, but mm -hmm. it's a function. Right. So we we'll go from high to low concentration because we have a concentration gradient, but what is the concentration? What is, when we say we have a concentration gradient, what are we talking about? A difference in concentration. So it's a difference across the space. So like, um, so you can have high concentration in one area and low concentration in another area. And so this is um, with a particular mole uh, molecule called the bicoid protein. So let me explain here. So this is a fruit fly. You don't have this picture, you have the next picture here. But this is a fruit fly. This is the larva stage of the fruit fly. So on the top here is the wild type larva. Wild type meaning how it's normally supposed to develop. So on this end we have the head region. On this end, we have the tail region. So what they did to study this is they took some fruit flies and they um, induced mutations. They exposed it to radiation, trying to get mutations to happen. And then they let these flies, that they tried to induce these mutations, they're trying to mutate them, um, they let them mate and then have babies. And then it's, this is the larva. So some of them turned out normal, but what they were looking at, or looking for, is the mutant ones. So what they found is some larva had two tails, so they did, they had a two a tail region where a head region should be, all right. And so so then from that they can study what went wrong. So this is what they found out about development of the fruit fly larva. All right. So here let me explain what you're looking at here. It says developing egg cell. This right here. This is kind of confusing here. This is the egg. This is going to be your egg cell. Remember egg cells are developed from um, germ cells through meiosis, you know, it divides by meiosis and so on, and the ovaries and so on. Um, in this developing egg cell, this is the egg cell, this is the nucleus of the egg cell, all right, so this is the nucleus of your egg cell. These nurse cells, um, so this is confusing for some people, this, these nurse cells are cells that, notice the arrows here to the egg cell, um, so it makes certain molecules in the, pro, uh, in the cytoplasm that it delivers and gives to the um, egg cell. So it's, it's um, giving molecules and it's contributing to the cytoplasm of the egg cell, these nurse cells. But, th but this is the egg cell that will be fertilized all right, and, and develop into the zygote. So then, so then here is, it says a mature unfertilized egg cell. So it hasn't been fertilized. So notice here it doesn't, the, it doesn't have the nurse cells and so on. So this is your mature um, egg cell. And notice here that it says bicoid mRNA in mature unfertilized egg cell. So in the nucleus here, in the nucleus of this um, egg cell, you have or the mother has what's called the bicoid gene. It codes for making um, uh, bicoid proteins. So this is your, in the DNA, right? Genes are in your DNA. So <coughs> in the egg cell, what the mom does is code and take that DNA and make an mRNA from it. So that's transcription. And so that happens in the unfertilized egg cell. So they, they uh, in the unfertilized egg cell, you have the mRNA. They, uh, color coded it or tagged it, dyed it, so we could see the mRNA. What they found is this mRNA was highly con concentrated on one side of the egg cell and not on the other. The, the, so the staining, you don't see any of this mRNA. So now what happens is, as I'm showing you here, fertilization happens. So sperm comes over here, fertilizes this egg cell, and now you get your developing baby. Um, once fertilization happens, then translation occurs and the bicoid protein starts to be made. So this was just the mRNA, and now we get the protein, so they stained it here. And what you see is a very high concentration of bicoid protein on this end. So I'm gonna put an up arrow, and I'm gonna put bicoid protein in concentration brackets. So there's high concentration of bicoid protein on this side, and then as we go here, we have low concentration of bicoid, or no, protein on this side. This is a gradient, all right? So we have differences in concentration of this. Notice that it's made in the same plot side that the mRNA is, and that makes sense. So the mRNA codes for making the protein, and so there, that's what we have. So what they found is that as they watched this embryo develop, this region developed into the head, this region developed into the tail, 
And so in finding this, they found that every single time looking at this, uh, the, air, the, the end that developed in the head, uh, developed into the head uh, region always had this high concentration of bicoid protein. So let me ask you this. I showed you the picture previous to this of the mutant uh, fly that had two tail regions. So, <coughs> so what I'd like you to do is to um, think about what would this picture look like for the mutant. So, talk to the person you're next to. What would that picture look like for the mutant with two tail regions? <laughs> So therefore, this whole part would kind of look like this end here. So you wouldn't have a gradient. Why? What would make that happen? Yawen? Yeah, what would make that happen is all the way back up in mom's egg cell, she has a mutation of that bicoid gene. So then she doesn't make the mRNA. So the mRNA doesn't get it put in her egg cell, so now when the egg cell is fertilized, it never makes the bicoid protein, all right? And so therefore, um, the that's another example of the importance of the mother's egg cell in developing properly, all right? So the mom's egg cell is pretty important, all right? So the bicoid research is important for three regions, three reasons, not regions. It identified a specific protein the bicoid protein required for some early steps in pattern formation. It increased the understanding of the mother's role in embryonic development. And then it demonstrated a key developmental principle that a gradient of molecules can determine polarity and position in the embryo. And so, so it's not just the presence or, or absence, it can be the gradient. genes and so on and so um, during development remember that apoptosis is also an important part of development in some cells so apoptosis is a program cell death that occurs through the normal course of development it's usually triggered by signals that activate a cascade of signal proteins so this is what we talked about this in chapter 11 um, so it triggers the cells to die um, and so during that process the cell shrinks the nucleus breaks down and the nearby cells quickly engulf and break down the contents of the cell. And so this is a normal part of development. We talked about the tissue in between the fingers and the toes, and this is a mouse um, uh, paw, uh, the same kind of idea here. So I just wanted to reiterate that because it kind of goes into uh, morphogenesis and the shape of the organism. Uh, and this picture here shows you um, uh, what triggers this? And so just this is a review from chapter 11 that remember you have a death ligand, a death signal that binds to a receptor protein that triggers a um, phosphorylation cascade that ultimately activates enzymes that will digest and break down the nucleus and so on and so forth and kill the cell. 
but that doesn't happen when there's no death ligand. All right, so it only is triggered to happen when it's communicated. So, so it's essential for development of certain um, cells. All right, so that's just a quick little review here. So then the last little bit of this, uh, these notes, is about the genes that control segmentation. So we're going to look more specifically about um, type, uh, certain types of genes called homeotic genes. Looking across species, there are many similarities in the genes controlling development. So when you look at organisms that don't seem very similar, um, and, and so a fly, a yeast, human, a mouse, all right, all look very differently, but when you look at the genes that control the development of us, we have quite a few similarities. So what I'm going to have us do is let's here do the homeobox reading slash coloring sheet. So the thing you picked up here today says animal body plans, homeobox genes. And so <laughs> the first, and you can um, take the two pages and um, staple them. It'll be helpful. But what you need to do is on the reading part, I want you to read. I want you to annotate, underline, um, and so on. And then as you read through it, it's going to ask you to do some things on the picture sheet. Uh, and so in the picture sheet, uh, if you just look at that for a second, it compares and contrasts two organisms, an invertebrate, which is uh, the fly, and a vertebrate, which is the mouse, and the bottom picture is the mouse embryo. And so in the center are the genes that control the development. So you can see Drosophila and the mouse um, genes. And so it's going to be comparing and contrasting and looking at genes and how they control um, body plans um, and so on. So I'm going to have you read through it. As you read through it, it's going to ask you to do certain things. You're going to need colors to do that. Um, so that's why I have up in the front, I have colored pencils, I have markers, uh, and so on. So when you get to that point, um, you can use those if you want to come up and get them now. So you have them when you get to that point. But, um, but make sure you read through it because it's going to explain these genes. Okay? I'm going to give you a few minutes. Back to the, the uh, um, in the front side of the reading, it talked about how they, they thought it was a little weird when like they found one mutation, but then it totally changed the segmentation of the, the fly from one mutation. And if there's lots of genes that control this, how can one mutation change the fly that much? And it's because of these small numbers of genes um, called um, uh, homeobox genes that control this body plan and the segmentation and, and um, they have the invertebrate, the Drosophila, and the vertebrate, the, the mouse, to show you that even organisms that, looking at them, clearly have a lot of differences between them, that there are some of these genes in common between them that code for or turn on genes that um, cause the same type of segmentation with the Drosophila as well as the mouse. Um, the mouse has the same order, but notice that the genes are spread throughout four different chromosomes, where it's all on um, one on the mouse, but in terms of the order, um, as Liam said, they absolutely are the same. And the order on the DNA on the chromosomes actually also follow the order in which the segmentation on the um, actual organism. So it shows relatedness. Um, between these species and that, that, that the key there is that these small number of genes control uh, uh, this development. And so how do these small numbers of genes control development? So that's what I want to talk about next. So I'm going to have you on this, I'm going to flip the sheet over because I'm going to draw a, some things on there with you to show
What was that? Um, I'm putting different colors to illustrate different parts. I mean, I guess you don't have to. Okay. But it might help. It might be helpful. All right, you guys. So we're going to draw what these homeo box genes do. Okay. Clean off my thing. Yeah. Okay, so what we're going to do is, this all starts in a piece of DNA. Whoa, I'm on the ceiling. You don't want to look at the ceiling here. So we're going to draw a segment of DNA. And a gene, a gene is a segment of your DNA, right? So I'm going to put here, right, from right here to right here is your gene. And this is, we're going to call this a homeotic gene. Now, what is a homo homeotic gene? It's a regulatory gene. That means it's going to regulate something. It's going to turn something on or off. Regular, regulatory gene to help determine pattern formation. So what we just looked at. Now, notice that the, the title of the, the reading that you did talked about homeobox genes. And so these are genes that contain a region within the gene. So I'm going to pick a different color. Within this one gene, there is a region, a segment of DNA within that gene called the homeobox region. So the homeo box, um, we could say, is the part of the homeotic gene and what this does is this part, it codes, so the part of the homeotic gene that codes for a part of a protein called the homeo domain. All right, a lot of homeo words here. I'm going to talk about this later as we draw in our picture. So right now, you just need to know that this is a part of a larger gene that regulates development. <laughs> Now, what are we going to do to make a protein? This gene codes for making a protein. Before we make a protein, we have to do what to the gene? Transcribe it, right? So we're going to go through and put an arrow here, transcription. So when we, at the end of transcription, we have a molecule of mRNA. So uh, here's the start of the DNA. So I'm going to start right here and make the mRNA is about as long as the gene was. All right, so eyeballing it there. So this is your mRNA. But when the mRNA is made from the DNA, this gene, it also copies that homeobox region. So I'm going to put here, here's your homeobox region. After transcription comes translation, right? So we go, um, I'm not showing you here, we would cut out the introns, add the cap and the tail, the mRNA leaves the nucleus and goes to the ribosome where translation occurs. So let's look here, translation. And I'll draw the finished product tomorrow. I'll go. All right, because we're going to run out of time here. All right, so we'll pick right up right at this spot tomorrow. No. So 
you, you guys should pretty much have your review sheet pretty much done at this point. If you haven't done that, you're behind. <laughs>